And if you haven't done so already, you can mute your sound in the lower left corner. Yeah, so um, to the participants, um, what Mindy was saying, if you mute yourself, so in the left corner, there's a little microphone. And so if you have the, the red microphone with a line through it, that means you are muted, which is helpful so everyone can hear. So on iPads, it's in the upper right. Ah, okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Every device is a little different. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to try again. Can you guys see my slides here? Yep. Okay, perfect. So um, as you all know, we're going to be hearing um, from Dr. Jody Corey Bloom. Thank you so much, Dr. Bloom, for giving us a little bit of your time this morning. We really appreciate We're really excited to hear what you have to say today. Good, love to and do it. And then following you, we have Allison Bartlett, who's gonna be um, talking about some other uh, really great topics referring to benefits, which for HD families, you know, is, is something that they, we're all gonna need to tackle. And so it's, it's another great opportunity to hear some great information um, and ask some questions. All right. So. Next, we just wanna let everyone know that um, because of COVID, we are having to get creative with things and we won't be doing a walk this year, but instead we're going to be doing a virtual scavenger hunt. So it's gonna be family friendly, everyone can do it. You don't have to have social media. It's actually, um, we're gonna be doing it through an app that you download. And we have different questions, different challenges um, asking you to answer. And what's neat about doing it through the app is you can um, see what other teams are, are submitting and doing. And so you can get a little, little competitive. Um, but this is uh, gonna be happening October 17th. So if you have any questions, please let us know. We would love to um, get feedback, see if this is um, you know, something that people are willing to, to do. But again, we're putting a lot of work into it to try to make it as, as fun as possible. Um, next, we just wanted to let you guys know um, that we started the Impact HD program. So this is um, an opportunity for you to fundraise for HDSA, doing um, anything that you enjoy doing. So with the little um, symbols here, you can see a person running, a person swimming, cycling, yoga, anything um, that you enjoy doing. What we can do is we set you up with a fundraiser page so you can share that to your network of people and, and share with them what you're doing. It also helps us get the word out and, and spread um, you know, information about what Huntington's disease is as well as raising funds. And the funds that we raise go to um, the wonderful programs that we're able to offer. Um, Dr. Corey Bloom, um, being a center of excellence, um, we're able to support you and, and, and the work that you do, um, as well as um, the support group that we have every month and, and some of the other services that we're doing, including this, the educational series that now we're doing on a bi-monthly um, uh, timeline uh, in, a, in a virtual way. So the last thing is, is um, under kind of the Impact HD is we started doing a 555 campaign um, where we are asking people to do something that is associated with the number five. So that could be like 5K, baking five pies. Um, you know, uh, um, you can pretty much be as creative as you want. Um, Margaret, I'm gonna call you out here and I know that you sewed five masks <laughs> and um, gave, gave those away to people. And so it, again, it's an opportunity to fundraise um, where you nominate five people and ask them to donate $5. So again, just an easy way to kind of get people involved with the, the fundraising um, so we can keep helping our, our HD families. So those are all the slides that I have. Dr. Bloom, I'm going to just read a quick bio for those of you who don't know who Dr. Jody Corey Bloom is. She is the director of UCSD's Huntington's Disease uh, Clinical Research Program. 
UCSD HDSA Center of Excellence, so a COE, and the Genetically Handicapped Persons Program. She is a member of the Enroll HD Executive Oversight Committee and a member of the Executive Committee of the Huntington Study Group. Dr. Corey Bloom has been the principal investigator for over 50 clinical trials for the treatment of various dementine conditions. She has been honored as top doctor in the field of neurology by San Diego County Medical Society for the past nine years and was selected by US News and World Report as top doctor of neurology and neurosurgery for 2011 to 2012. So, Welcome, Dr. Corey Bloom. Thank yeah. you so much again. Sure. Um, if you want to go ahead now and share your screen so we can get your PowerPoint up. Okay, there we go. I think. Now I share that and then let's see if we can get it. Is that working? Can you guys see the slides or no? Yes. Yes, everybody can see it. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much. Thanks for the introduction. It's like you guys are incredibly busy doing things. I'm um, really um, impressed with all of the things that you have on the agenda here. So hopefully we can all help too at the center. All right. So let's talk a little bit about uh, HD. I think the outline I thought about to, for today would be talk a little bit about the genetics of Huntington's disease, the pathophysiology, some of the current therapies for HD, uh, and then also, and primarily, the investigational therapies for HD, symptomatic therapies, and also disease modifying. Sometimes people will stop me and say, well, you know, what's the difference? What do you mean? So symptomatic would be a therapy that might help right now with a symptom. So if you have chorea and you take a medication like um, uh, tetrabenazine, for example, that will actually help with that symptom. So that would be a symptomatic therapy. Disease modifying is sort of where we think we're heading. And basically, that's going to be therapy that doesn't necessarily um, become apparent immediately, the effects of it. But what we hope it does is actually delay the progression of disease, slow the onset of disease. Uh, and, you know, if we're lucky, maybe actually um, stabilize or, or help people be slightly better. But that's really the concept behind disease modifying. It really changes the trajectory uh, of the Huntington's disease itself. All right. So HD, I think most of you know, was described in 1872 by Dr. George Huntington in Long Island, New York. And he noticed a lot of things. He actually traced many of the Long Island families uh, who had Huntington's disease uh, to immigrants who had come from Buris, England, and who had landed in New England in 1649. And he also noticed that if children go through life without Huntington's disease, then the thread is broken, and so the next generation doesn't have it. So pretty incredible observations, I think, for someone uh, in the 1800s. It is a prototypical autosomal dominant uh, genetic disorder. Um, the HTT gene, I think, as most of you know, was sequenced in 1993 uh, after a 10-year effort. So that's 17 years ago now. Wait, no, 27 years ago now. Yeah, so 27 years ago now um, that the HD gene was actually uh, sequenced. And it is located uh, in exon 1 on the short arm of chromosome 4. And we now know that the gene consists of a trinucleotide repeat, a CAG repeat. And it actually was one of the first trinucleotide repeat disorders described. There are many others now, myotonic dystrophy, spinocerebellar degeneration, but this was really one of the first trinucleotide repeat disorders described. And oh, actually what you can see there, I think in that little picture, which is a cartoon, which is kind of cute, is you actually can see uh, in the, the gene, the CAG repeats, CAG, see that CAG, CAG in, this, in the double helix. So you actually can see that. And it's unfortunately, the problem is there's nothing wrong with the CAG repeats themselves. 
actually it's quite a normal phenomenon. It's the number of them. So there are just too many of them uh, in Huntington's disease, too many of those repeats. And it's the number of repeats that gives rise to that important CAG repeat number that people are always sort of talk about with regard to HD diagnosis. So it's the actual number. If you have a low number of repeats below 20, um, for example, that's actually very, very normal. It's when we get to this, the higher numbers, the, the 29, 30, 30, uh, low 30s, those are the ones where we start to see, and then of course, obviously 40s and 50s, where we start to see uh, some difficulties. And actually that's, you can see that right here. Normal is actually less than 26 CAG repeats. We know that if you have less than 26 CAG repeats, you yourself will not be affected by the disease and there's really no risk to, to children. Um, 36 to 39, we talk about something called reduced penetrance. People may or may not be affected in their lifetime. Uh, and there's a 50% risk uh, to the next generation. 40 plus CAG repeats, this is a fully penetrant mutation. Usually if people live long enough, they will definitely be affected. And again, there is that 50% risk to offspring. Probably the most interesting group is that group that's 27 to 35. We call those intermediate alleles. Uh, that group is usually not affected in lifetime. They seem to have an elevated risk to their children, uh, but it's less than 50%. So it's sort of a group that we're really studying and keeping an eye on because we didn't know a lot about them for a long time. Um, in HD, we can see the phenomenon of anticipation. And what that means is that if, it, if the gene and, and the disease exists in one generation, that often the next generation, the children, may have a little bit of an earlier onset. They may have a higher CAG repeat number and a little bit of an earlier onset. Um, and usually that happens, especially with paternal inheritance. So when the gene comes through the father, it's particularly unstable. There's a lot of what we call meiotic instability. Uh, and so you can see rapid increases in the number of CAG repeats from father to either son or daughter. Um, we don't really know exactly what the function of uh, HTT is. Um, it, we know that the gene encodes for what we call a poly Q uh, region of the HTT, um, but, but we don't really understand exactly what the function is because we know that there's a, a certain amount of it's good and normal and it must do something uh, really positive, uh, but we really uh, don't uh, quite understand it, unfortunately. So I want to start with the neuron or the nerve cell. So this is really a sort of a schematic, a cartoon of a nerve cell, a neuron, we call it. And the brain and spinal cord have billions and billions of these neurons. And these are how messages are actually sent. And the messages are sent from one neuron to the next. And it's really fascinating. Uh, we call this the cell body. Some people call it the soma. These are what are called dendrites. Right in here, we have the nucleus. Here's the nucleus in here. This is where actually all the DNA is located in a nerve cell. Um, this cable here is called the axon. Uh, and this cable is what's really, they can be quite long. Uh, and then we have, of course, the axon terminals. Uh, and so uh, we think that each neuron forms as many as a thousand connections with other neurons. And this is how information is passed throughout the nervous system to glands, to muscles, to other nerve cells. So this is really a very, very important uh, part. And we think that HD, as I said, is caused by a mutation in the HTT gene. Um, and um, what we see here is actually the DNA uh, in this upper panel. We're looking at the situation where there's no gene mutation, no HTT mutation. In this second panel here, uh, we're looking at the situation in which there is an HTT mutation, okay? So, where there is no mutation, the normal situation, we refer to it as wild type Huntington. And through a process called transcription, okay, 
we make the HTT mRNA or messenger RNA. This is kind of the in-between, kind of like the recipe. You can think of it like the recipe. And then through a process called translation, we make the protein. And because it's normal protein, we call it wild type uh, HTT. So this is the kind of normal Huntington that does something. We don't exactly know what, but when it's present, we've got normal cellular function uh, and a normal individual. And unfortunately, when the mutation is present, so when there is an area, the mutation is present, what's transcribed there, it, it's transcribed into what's called mutant Huntington messenger RNA, and then translated into the mutant protein, okay? And unfortunately, we know that as a result of that, there is cellular dysfunction, the cells die, okay? And then the individual develops the HD symptom. So it's really the production of the mutant Huntington in the brain that leads to the death of, of nerve cells. And I tried to show that here, just kind of pictorially to kind of see that. So you see all this mutant Huntington, there it is, okay? And it seems to accumulate in the cells. It's globby and it's aggregates and it just accumulates in the cells and it sort of chokes them off a little bit. They can't function normally because they're filled with all of this kind of mutant Huntington. So that neuron tends to actually die as a result. And we lose a lot of nerve cells because of that. And you can actually see right here kind of what it looks like uh, in reality. There's some old ones and some newer ones. This is electron microscopy. This is actually histo regular histology. And you can see here the accumulation in this EM photomicrograph. You can see here the accumulation of Huntington right within the nucleus. So you could imagine all this garbage clogging up the cell ultimately is toxic to the cell and leads to the cell death is what we think. All right, and so we end up then with widespread degeneration in the brain, a lot of loss of nerve cells. The areas that are struck particularly uh, heavy would be the areas of the basal ganglia and also the cerebral cortex, which you're sort of seeing on the side right here. This is what we call a coronal section. So here you're kind of cutting uh, from top to bottom right through the brain. Uh, and what you see here are actually deep in the brain, um, the caudate nucleus. And many of you know that the caudate is very important in the development of Huntington. And also what we call the striatum. This is the putamen and the globus pallidus. So it's these structures right here that make up what we call the basal ganglia. So the first thing you can see is that they're deep in the brain. Okay. So um, any any um, medication or any therapy that we try to give to those basal ganglia are not so easy to get to. Now, luckily, this is the ventricular system. These are ventricles. These are fluid filled. And there's also fluid over the top of the brain and underneath the brain that you don't see here. And here's another little set of ventricles here. So we can put stuff into that fluid. And, and I'll tell you about that later. We'll talk about that later. But that would be a way to try and get at these deep structures that are here deep in the brain. But the cortex of the brain, this is the real thinking part of the brain, the real uh, intellectual part of the brain. The cortex is actually also very involved in, in Huntington's disease. And so the cell loss that we're talking about occurs in these structures deep in the brain and also occurs in the cerebral cortex. And we can actually look right here at uh, what happens with these macroscopic changes to the striatum and the cortex. So we think that actually occurs in what we call the prodromal stage of Huntington's disease. In other words, we start to lose those nerve cells in the prodromal stage early before people are even diagnosed with Huntington's disease they're actually losing those cells. And remember, people are born with the mutation. If you were to test a newborn baby, they would have the mutation then. It's just that in Huntington's disease, people don't begin to show symptoms, usually for decades, three decades, four decades, five decades. So it's very common for people to start to show symptoms, usually 30, 40 to 50, somewhere in that range, okay? 
um, but they've already had the mutation since birth. So they've been accumulating microscopic and macroscopic changes to their striatum and cortex. And you can see here an individual with the mutation at 40, at 45, and at 50, okay? They are initially prodromal. They are in the earlier stages here, more advanced as time goes on. And you can see what happens. Look at these ventricles. Look at them there and there, and then now here, same individual. Those ventricles, those fluid-filled areas are much larger. Why are they so much larger? Because of nerve cell loss, okay? The nerve cells disappear and the fluid fills in the space. Oops, sorry. And the next thing that you see uh, is also a loss of cell bodies. And you can really see it in the tissue. Look at this caudate right here, this whole structure. And then look at the caudate right there, much smaller, okay? So even just over those five years, there's been a real diminution, a real loss of cells in that caudate nucleus. And the same happens in the putamen and the globus pallidus. And you can even see it in the cortex. Uh, as you start to look, you see much more fluid, much more darker areas, deeper crevices here, uh, areas here that are much larger. These are flip filled with fluid because of the cell loss. So atrophy, the ventricles become enlarged, the gray matter, and then the subcortical white matter, which is this stuff right here, uh, undergoes shrinkage. The whole brain really uh, begins to shrink. The natural course, as you know, varies significantly. Uh, we, we used to say, oh, well, you'll probably start to get, you know, symptoms whenever your parents got symptoms. How old were your parents when they got symptoms? Oh, your symptoms will probably start then. But we know that's not really true now. One thing we know is that oftentimes, especially if the gene comes through the father, that, that symptoms may actually start earlier. But we also know, so for example, if you look here, this is probably at about oh, I don't know, 43, probably 43 CAG repeats. Everyone in this line has 43 CAG repeats. But the age at onset ranges from about 18 to about 60, 70, okay? So look at that. That is amazing. That is five decades worth almost, okay, of variation in onset. These people all had the same CAG repeat number, but the variation in age at onset is almost five decades. So why is that? Well, we think that there are modifier genes, number one. We also think that there are different things that change things, psychiatric factors, behavioral factors, maybe medical factors. I mean, all kinds of things that can actually change the onset of the disease. But I think as, you know, as I've often said to you, if we could even delay the onset of Huntington's disease by five years, that would be really significant for a lot of people, okay? I mean, that's not a cure, obviously, but just delaying the onset is really a, a major thing. And we know for Alzheimer's disease, for example, if you delay the onset by just five years, you actually have the prevalence. So we don't have that kind of data for Huntington's disease, but having the prevalence go from 14 million people to 7 million people uh, with Alzheimer's disease is pretty significant. And so that kind of thing I think is in our grasp to do, to delay the onset of disease. So as we said, the natural clinical course varies, typical age of symptom onset, 30s to 50s, mean is about 45 years. And we say it's about 10 to 30 years from symptom onset to death. Some people have very, very, very slow progression. What this graph shows you is that there's a loose correlation between CAG repeat length and symptom onset and rate of disease progression. So if you look on the, you probably can't see my finger, sorry. If you look on the y-axis is the age of onset, as we mentioned, this is the number of CAG repeats. So it looks as if the lower the number of CAG repeats, it's only 40 here, the later the age at onset, the higher the number of CAG repeats here, 55, the earlier. So these are primarily juvenile HD or a lot of juvenile HD patients here. So they're much younger when the disease progresses or comes on. 
And then the clinical presentation, the triad, there's motor symptoms, cognitive symptoms, psychiatric symptoms. Um, the motor symptoms, I think it's fair to say, uh, are initially pretty subtle, uh, but they do progress and they largely progress during the manifest HD stage. Um, the behavioral symptoms can be episodic and they can actually occur many years before diagnosis. Sometimes people will say, well, she wasn't diagnosed until she was 50, but she had depression that started in her 30s or, or you know, behavioral problems in her 30s. So that's pretty common. And then the cognitive symptoms we know from various studies can occur up to 15 years before motor uh, onset, and they tend to deteriorate steadily. What kinds of behavioral symptoms? Well, suicidal ideation, depression, impaired judgment, anxiety, apathy, obsessive compulsiveness. These are all pretty common uh, in HD. Cognitively, we tend to see that people have difficulty retrieving new information. They have reduced mental flexibility. So using information to kind of solve problems becomes difficult. Planning becomes difficult. Um, perceptual problems. And then uh, motorically, sorry, I think every time I move my mouse, it moves. Uh, motorically, we see obviously the chorea, but also dystonia, rigidity, slowing, that's bradykinesia, speech and swallowing problems, and gait and balance problems. So juvenile HD is a very different subset of people. We don't know a lot about it. We know that basically, People are less than 20 with onset, when 20 years old with onset. Typically, they have very high numbers of CAG repeats, usually more than 55. So that's very high. They're a very small percentage of all the HD cases, about 5 to 10%. They tend to have much less chorea. We usually don't see much chorea in juvenile Huntington. They tend to have more Parkinsonism, stiffness, rigidity, bradykinesia, difficulty with walking. We don't know why the phenotype is so different, um, but it's a very dramatic um, phenotype and very difficult for us. Uh, we, in the clinic, find it really hard. It's just so hard to see children like this. And, and also there tends to be a lot of psychosis, a lot, a lot, a lot of behavioral issues. So currently, I think most of you know, we have two FDA approved uh, drugs for uh, Huntington's disease. They are both for the chorea of Huntington's disease. They're called VMAT2 inhibitors, tetrabenazine, and then more recently, dutetrabenazine or Osteto. Um, but they are only symptomatic therapies focused on the chorea. We often will also use off-label treatments for Huntington's though. We use neuroleptics. Some people take prolixin or risperidol for the chorea or for the psychosis. We use antidepressants, we use mood stabilizers. So all of those things are, are you know, excellent for HD, but they are off-label treatments. Um, we have no proven therapies for cognition, uh, and we have, as I said, no disease-modifying therapy. And that's really where I think a lot of people are focused right now, because what we really want to do is give people therapies, especially therapies that are safe, give it to them when they're younger or 10 or 15 or 20 years from the onset of symptoms to try and really delay the onset of disease if we can, or maybe stabilize it altogether uh, if it's strong enough. So let's talk a little bit about some of the investigational therapies that we have. Um, well, I guess, first of all, I should say the one symptomatic therapy that we do have uh, right now being tested, I should have, um, is uh, another vesicular monoamine transporter 2 or VMAT2 inhibitor, and this is called valbenazine. valbenazine. Um, this is a medication that's sponsored by neurocrine and the HSG, the study is sponsored, sorry. It's a phase three placebo-controlled study. We are doing it here at UCSD. Um, you cannot have been on any previous VMAT2 inhibitors, though, unfortunately. So if you have been on Osteto or if you have been on tetrabenazine, you can't um, participate in this, this study. It's only three months, but that's, it does have an open label. And so it's a capsule. It's administered orally once daily 
uh, and and the, the primary outcome measures in this trial are change from baseline to maintenance uh, in the UHDRS total maximal Korea score. So if there's anyone out there who's or knows somebody who's really would be interested in participating, it's really a very short study, but it would help us a lot to see if this is actually a good drug uh, for um, uh, HD for the Korea. All right, so as I said, how about the disease modifying therapies? What would those look like? What would they do for us? Well, if you think about it, if you believe that those aggregates, those clumps that we talked about that were in the cells that were choking them off and causing them to die, if you believe that they're harmful to cells and can do what we sort of think they do, the question would be if we lowered the amount of Huntington protein that accumulates in the cells and in the brain, can we prevent all the consequences of having that HD mutation? And that's really you know, what the crux is of Huntington lowering therapy. Um, because we know that, as I said, the gene by way of transcription becomes uh, messenger RNA, which by way of translation becomes that Huntington protein, which is abnormally sized and clumsy. And so it ends up clumping and aggregating in the cells um, and and then, as we said, killing the cells. So everything that we've done to date, um, so, and we will talk uh, a little bit more about the um, Roche trial in that respect, the antisense oligonucleotide. Everything that we've done to date is really focused, if you will, on this part of things, okay? So we said we have a gene, we have messenger RNA, and then by way of translation, the protein. Most everything that we are doing now and kind of looking at has been with regard to this messenger RNA. So the, the Roche trial, for example, uh, is actually using an antisense oligonucleotide, and we'll talk more about that, uh, to decrease the amount of message so that we decrease the amount of mutant Huntington protein. Um, there are small molecules that may actually help to decrease the amount of message. There are uh, RNAs, uh, interfering RNAs, that may help to decrease the amount uh, of message. The other thing, though, that people are also focusing on is actual gene therapy, if you will, using things like zinc finger proteins and CRISPR technology to try and decrease, not in this case, the amount of RNA, but to change the DNA, if you will, okay? So they're all aimed at ultimately decreasing protein, but it's just a matter of how you go about it, how you approach doing that. So these are all what we would call disease-modifying therapies uh, for Huntington's. So as I mentioned, what we have right now, and we have this in human trials, are the antisense oligonucleotides, okay, so the Roche, antisense oligonucleotide is an example of that. Uh, people are looking at uh, developing interfering RNAs, and then I mentioned the zinc finger transcriptional repressors uh, and the CRISPR uh, technology. So all of this is in play right now. It's an incredibly exciting time, honestly. Now, the antisense oligonucleotide is the one that's the furthest along, okay? So I think we should focus on that first. And as I said, it selectively binds. You see here, not double strand, but a single stranded uh, I, that will actually uh, bind with the Huntington uh, messenger RNA. It really flags that messenger RNA for destruction. And so because that become, that's destroyed, you cannot then make the protein. So less protein is made because you have less of the messenger RNA. So it interferes uh, significantly with this process uh, of translation. And that's actually how it works. We are actually delivering to patients intrathecally by lumbar puncture, by spinal tap, this antisense oligonucleotide that then goes and binds with the messenger RNA in a very specific way, flags it for destruction, and as a result, because there's less messenger RNA, less Huntington protein uh, is made. Now, one of the things about the current Roche program is that it doesn't really delineate between mutant Huntington and normal Huntington. So it basically flags all of it. 
benefit for destruction. So we get less protein made overall, mutant and normal, okay? And as we said, um, the antisense oligonucleotide drug is injected into HD patients um, uh, through, their, um, through a spinal tap, through a lumbar puncture. And so it goes right into the cerebrospinal fluid. And so when we were looking at those MRIs before, we noticed all those fluid filled areas. You can see them, they're kind of nicely delineated here in the blue. And these are called uh, basal or cistern is an area right here. You can see through to some of the ventricle, one of the lateral ventricles there. So all of these areas, and, with, and, and what's really interesting about it is that cerebrospinal fluid really circulates. We are actually gonna put our needle in way down here to deliver the antisense oligonucleotide. And then that has to actually climb up and sort of over the top of the brain and then filter down into some of these cistern areas, uh, et cetera. So it's a little harder to get at some of the deeper structures, right? The deeper structures are kind of in this area. And so it's not perfect by any means, not perfect. Um, but the current, or I should say the current um, Roche program uh, first had a small phase 1b 2a multi-center randomized placebo-controlled trial. They included 46 patients. They followed them for uh, four months after the last dose. Uh, 34 of the patients were randomly assigned to one of five doses uh, of the drug uh, every four weeks. So they ended up getting a total of four doses. Uh, 12 subjects were randomized to uh, placebo lumbar puncture. And they looked primarily at safety because that's what a phase 1B2A study does. They looked at safety. They also looked at the amount of Huntington uh, in the spinal fluid and then some pre-specified exploratory things uh, that they looked at. There were no uh, safety issues really. I mean, there was the kinds of things that you might expect. Some people had some headaches, um, some people had some pain, but in general, there was nothing that really uh, worried anybody, uh, to be honest with you. And what they did find was actually pretty exciting. They found that the drug did what it was designed to do. And I think that's the critical thing. So what you see here, what they're looking at is the amount of mutant Huntington in the spinal fluid. Okay, that's on this y-axis here. This is the amount of mutant Huntington. And what you're seeing here on the x-axis are all the different doses of the uh, drug, 10 milligrams, 30 milligrams, 60 milligrams, 90 milligrams, 120, and also placebo. And I think what you can see is, this is the mean for placebo in the amount of Huntington. This is for the 10 milligrams, for the 30 milligrams, for the 60 milligrams, 90, and 120. And so it looked as if it lowered, okay, the amount of Huntington in the spinal fluid, and this is actually the percent change, um, in a dose-dependent fashion. So it looked as if the higher the dose, the more lowering that we got until um, this level. So the 90 and 120 looked actually uh, pretty similar. But in general, there was a dose-dependent uh, lowering. And we now know that with time, it looks as if there's probably more lowering uh, with time as time goes on. And this is from uh, some of the uh, open label data that they're acquiring. And so that's all a very good sign. What we don't know, unfortunately, is whether or not there are actual uh, changes in the brain right? Because all we have access to is the spinal fluids. So that's really critical. We don't know if there are any changes in the brain. And we really don't know a lot about the patients themselves. They did do some preliminary studies to kind of look at whether or not there might be some motor and cognitive and functional changes. But in general, that's not what the study was designed to look at. So Generation HD1 is the study that's, under, that's, that's underway right now. Um, there are 660 participants in this study, all right? The, the endpoints for this study are dramatically different from what that small little open label study was designed to do. 
honestly, that little open label study was designed to see whether people keeled over or not. We didn't know what to think. You know, if we give this antisense oligonucleotide into someone's spinal fluid, what's going to happen? So the truth of the matter is that what, what that study was designed to do is what it should do as a safety study. Just make sure that nothing really bad happened to those 46 people that were in that study. Generation HD1 uh, is different, completely different. 660 patients, 120 of them in the US, the rest of them throughout the world. These are patients with manifest HD. They clearly had genetically confirmed Huntington's disease. They were 25 to 65 years of age independent scores of at least 70. These patients are getting placebo every eight weeks or actual drug every eight weeks or actual drug every 16 weeks uh, with placebo in between just so that nobody is unblinded. We don't want people to know. Uh, you know, if we only gave them, if we only gave them a lumbar puncture every four months, they'd know which group they're in. So, so they're getting placebo uh, on the alternating uh, eight weeks, just so that everybody's blinded. So we don't know, they don't know, nobody knows what they're getting, and we won't know until the end of the trial. We're about halfway through for our subjects right now. We have 17 patients here at UCSD. Everything has been going great. The LPs have been going great. They really have had no no serious uh, adverse events whatsoever. And sorry, uh, and the primary endpoints here though are looking at the actual efficacy. Is there a change in the composite UHDRS? Is there a change in total functional capacity? And just a ton of secondary uh, outcome measures. There will also be an open label extension. So all those wonderful people who agreed to take placebo throughout the trial so far are actually going to get real drug uh, when this when this is over. So that's you know when when they're done with the preceding study, they will roll over into this open label extension, and they will get the drug either every eight weeks or every sixteen weeks. And in the open label, we're really looking at the percentage of patients with AEs and, of course, also changes from baseline. Um, now, there is another antisense oligonucleotide trial that started. It's called Precision HD, um, um, Precision HD1 and Precision HD2. Um, I can't actually really tell you where it is right now, even though we have some people enrolled in this trial, but they've been awfully silent about where things stand. And so I don't really know, and we have not been able to get much information other than that things are proceeding, you know, but we really don't know. What they were actually looking at was targeting what are called SNPs. And SNPs are little pieces that are associated with the disease causing mutation in the mutant Huntington gene, uh, but the, this approach enables selective silencing of just the mutant uh, HTT, leaving the healthy allele alone uh, completely. Uh, and I think this is really a nice way to sort of look at it. Um, so if you pretend that this is actually the gene, okay, uh, and these little um, ribbons, if you will, uh, are actually those SNPs, all right? Um, it's really using a drone, shooting down the, the whole gene or the whole kite, if you will, um, by actually going for the ribbons, does, if that makes sense. So we're going for a little piece. We can't really get at this. We're going for a little piece to sort of uh, shoot at that ribbon instead of the whole kite, because we know that that's really enough to, to bring the whole thing down. We know that about two thirds of patients uh, will be either SNP1 or SNP2. So about 66, 67% of HD patients would be able to participate. There are some patients who actually have both, um, but, but about two thirds of patients will either, be, will either have SNP1 or SNP2. Um, we've only enrolled in SNP2 so far in the SNP2 trial. And the SNP1 seems to be on complete hold for reasons that we don't know. Uh, SNP2, I don't exactly know where that stands. Initially, it had multiple dosing, at least in the US. They, they decreased it to just single dosing. My understanding is that in Canada and Europe, there actually was multiple dosing, but I think our FDA was nervous about it. So I think you know, that was why we only did uh, single dosing. And I really 
uh, we are all in sort of a holding pattern uh, right now. Okay, so, um, however, I think the, the really exciting thing is that, as we said, that's the ASO story for right now, but there are other approaches to lower Huntington, and we use the analogy of the cookbook and the recipe and the cupcakes, and there are really many ways to make fewer cupcakes. You can decrease, uh, you know, the, the recipe in different ways um, and, and still come up uh, with fewer uh, cupcakes. And I think that's kind of the sense um, in a way. Um, if you think about it, we said you start with the DNA here uh, over on the left. Whoops. Every time I move my mouse, sorry, start with the DNA here over on the left. And we said that through that process of transcription, we made the messenger RNA and then through translation, the actual Huntington protein. Well, the antisense oligonucleotides that we just talked about work pretty much here, okay? But what if we kind of go over here and try to take a look at the DNA portion of things uh, and also the, the process of transcription itself? So there we can look at things like zinc finger proteins, small molecules, and that CRISPR uh, technology, uh, as I mentioned. So this is really gene therapy. This is what we really refer to as gene therapy. So far, at least to date, we're using harmless virus. We call it a modified adenovirus, a modified adeno-associated virus number five. That's uh, what's being used for the current trial that's underway. And what they're doing is inserting code for a microRNA uh, that's programmed to delete Huntington microRNA, okay? So effectively reduces the production of the mutant Huntington. So I think that that's important. It's a totally different. Here we're actually deleting uh, some of the HTT uh, microRNA. Uh, and so the treatment itself though is uh, arduous. It's, it's more difficult. It's much more involved than just giving a lumbar puncture, if you will. This is actually a direct injection of this into the brain, into the basal ganglia. So this is neurosurgery. This is going to require burr holes and catheters and general anesthesia. The nice side of it all is that most probably things that, that are the antisense oligonucleotides, the Roche trial, that's probably going to have to be given for life or at least for a very long time. This is probably a one and done situation. So even though it is neurosurgery, and even though it requires burr holes and catheters, it would be a one-time phenomenon and it should be good uh, after that. So I really tell people here about the Unicure trial. Um, this is also known as AMT-130, okay? And what the Unicure um, folks have done is to um, use an adeno-associated viral vector. We said this was number five. You can see the capsid right here. Uh, and inside, they have a microRNA uh, that's programmed to really delete, if you will, uh, the uh, uh, HTT uh, microRNA. And you can see how it's given. The patient actually receives this, this capsid, this viral vector, uh, a safe viral vector. Don't, I don't want you to think that you're going to get the virus as a result. Um, and it's actually delivered straight into um, the, the basal ganglia itself. Lest you think that this is just pie in the sky and not going to happen, I want you to know that this trial is actually underway and two patients have already received um, this uh, uh, drug. Um, they are going to be followed intensively for 18 months. Uh, they get lots of MRIs, lots of LPs, um, and then they'll, be they'll actually be followed after this kind of um, placebo-controlled portion of the trial, they'll be followed for five more years after that. So this really seeks to permanently change the genetic makeup uh, of patients. It doesn't just try to delete the HD mutation. This is pretty exciting stuff. I never really thought that we'd sort of really see it, but we are seeing it. As I said, it's a Unicure trial. It's a proof of concept gene therapy trial. Uh, it began in September of 2019. It was delayed a little bit because of COVID. It's a phase 1B2A first in human 
trial. There are three surgical sites right now, but more than that, uh, patients uh, or sites for referring patients. Um, there are expected to be 26 participants. They have to have early manifest HD, be age 25 to 65, uh, have CAG repeats that are at least 44, and that's to ensure that the patients would decline otherwise over a short period of time. Uh, 16 of the patients will get different, uh, will get uh, AMT 130, 10 uh, placebo or sham surgery. And if, again, because this is a 1B, 2A study, they're really looking more at safety uh, as opposed to uh, efficacy uh, with this trial. But I am happy to tell you, pleased to tell you that yesterday, okay, September 25th, uh, there was an announcement from Unicure recommend, uh, re reporting on the recommendations from their data safety and monitoring board um, indicating that they could go ahead, they could proceed with the next, with the study enrollment, that there were no significant safety concerns uh, observed in the first two patients that uh, had been uh, entered into the trial. Voyager Therapeutics also has uh, a similar uh, program. Uh, they are a little further away. I don't think that they're going to start until next year sometime, but there's their adeno-associated viral uh, capsid. Uh, they are also going to have um, a microRNA transgene uh, inside uh, from what we uh, understand. And again, what they're really trying to do is to selectively knock down or reduce uh, levels of uh, HTT uh, microRNA. There's also gene editing, uh, which I think is probably a little further away than, than these intrastriatal injections. Um, but gene editing uh, makes use of two technologies, zinc finger program, uh, uh, um, uh, factors, transcription factors, and CRISPR technology. So the zinc finger transcription factors bind to mutated HTT. Uh, and they block it from being transcribed and then translated uh, into mutant Huntington protein. CRISPR technology, on the other hand, uses single or double piece guide RNAs um, to introduce small mutations. Uh, and those mutations then attract this Casper cleavage enzyme, so this group of enzymes, to cut the actual DNA at targeted sites. So this is crazy. I mean, we're cutting DNA. I mean, this is like amazing. And then they also prevent the reincorporation uh, and then reduce the CAG repeat numbers uh, as a result. So the zinc finger drugs block the HD gene at its source, um, and they control whether a gene gets turned on or activated. They, the zinc finger molecules themselves stick to the harmfully long stretches of the HD gene or the mutant uh, HD gene uh, and tell the cells not to read it. And you can see some of the zinc finger transcription factors right here. They kind of look like fingers. You see them here? And here's a sort of another rendition of them. So somebody thought they looked like fingers, so they called them zinc finger protein transcription factors, uh, and they actually are the ones that go in uh, to and attach to the mutant uh, Huntington. And then also gene editing, the CRISPR, caspase 9. So these are enzymes. This is gene editing with a different kind of technology using CRISPR, caspase 9. It allows uh, you to cut the DNA at specific target sequences, as I said. So probably you're going to want to target the mutant sequences, right? And the guide RNA then finds the right spot. The caspase enzyme actually cuts the DNA. This is only being done in mice to date, not ready for humans as best we can tell. Uh, and delivering this to humans is probably going to be the most important uh, limitation. So my take on all of this is that we are inching ever closer to reality with disease-modifying therapy. We are going to have disease-modifying therapy. Uh, the antisense therapies are really the ones that are going to have the first results. Uh, they are currently, as you know, in human trials. They are likely going to slow the rate of progression. They're not going to cure HD, uh, but they're probably going to require ongoing therapy. Um, 
What we don't know is right now we're only looking at them in HD. What if we were to begin earlier in the pre-symptomatic phases? That would only be if it's really, really safe. Could they then be virtual cures, okay? Because we would be really early in the course of things. Uh, the gene therapies that I told you about are promising, but much more invasive. The gene editing are, as I said, fascinating, but still in uh, preclinical phases. So I just want to use my last minute or so to remind people that we've got a lot of stuff going on here at UCSD. Enroll is just a fabulous study. We really want to encourage people. We thank everybody who's involved in Enroll. We have almost 400 patients in this, but we could use more. Um, and so if you have a family member, a cousin, a sister, a brother, anybody who's not here, please encourage them to call us and to try and participate in Enroll. Um, Shield HD uh, is, uh, has completely enrolled already. This is a natural history study for triplet therapeutics. This is going to be another uh, um, uh, intrastriatal injection therapy uh, soon, maybe next year, but we're doing the natural history part of it now. It got completely enrolled very quickly. Thank you all very much. Um, we think Precision HD1 and 2, as I told you, are on hold. Generation HD1 is completely enrolled and ongoing. Uh, Connect HD, we are enrolling. That's the one for Korea. So if somebody hasn't been on tetrabenazine and has some Korea and thinks they might want to participate, please call us. Proof HD, the exciting news for everybody who loved Pridopidine. Remember that drug? Pridopidine, the heart HD drug. Anybody who loved Pridopidine, well, we are doing another Pridopidine study. It's going to start soon, probably within a month or so. Um, this was a very interesting drug, a heart HD drug. Um, it wasn't successful in terms of its primary endpoint before, but I really think uh, this is a much larger study and it looks like it's very, very well designed. Uh, so if you think you might be interested in going back on Pridopidine, let us know. Um, uh, Voyager will probably begin in 2021 sometime. So incredible in terms of the, the <laughs> HD research pipeline right now. And I just want to remind people that Enroll HD globally is up to something like 19,000 patients. I mean, it's just unbelievably crazy. Uh, oh, 18,895 with 30,000 baseline and follow up visits. You can call Haley or call any of us and we'll let you know. A sad mention for the people who I know were involved in Signal or the Vaxinex trial, we just got word yesterday uh, that, or the day before, that, that the phase two trial was probably negative in terms of the primary outcome measure. There will be um, uh, a, a meeting, a, a kind of a virtual meeting on Tuesday, so you can call Chase if you didn't get an email from us, you should have, um, to tell people about that, to sort of hear all of the details uh, about the outcome of that study. So I just want to leave you with this because I think this is, that was negative, but this is very, very hopeful. And this is just a summary slide of all of the Huntington lowering compounds that are currently in development, their mechanism of action, their class, uh, the patient populations that they're looking for, the stage uh, and the expected launch date. The future looks really, really bright for disease modifying therapy. And I'm just so excited because uh, I never thought I would see it in my lifetime, honestly, uh, but we are, it is here and we, we are seeing it. So, and there's only more to come. So I think I will stop there and say, thank you. I don't want you to start looking like this poor guy. Um, and uh, thank you very much for your attention. If anybody has any questions, I think fire away, unmute yourselves and fire away. Thank you, Dr. Bloom. Um, and I, I definitely echo that, that um, every year I hear you speak, um, you're adding more interesting studies um, to your lineup and it's so, so exciting to see. It is, I agree. Um, so does anyone have any questions for, for the doctor? Dr. Bloom, I have one question. Uh, sure. In regard to Val Benazine, yep. are there any negative um, side effects yeah, I, not really. I'm going to be honest with you. You know, it's actually already on the market for tardive dyskinesia. It's called Ingrezza, I-N-G-R-E-Z-Z-A. And so that medication has already been approved by the FDA for tardive dyskinesia. So it's safe. 
it did what they you know thought it would do for tardive dyskinesia and of course that's another hyperkinetic movement disorder sometimes it can be very difficult to tell uh, tardive dyskinesia from uh, facial chorea for example so we all expect everyone in the movement disorder field expects that the ingretza or the connect hd trial is going to be very positive uh, and so I would encourage people to, you know, if you haven't taken tetrabenazine or Osteto, to give Chase a call because, you know, I think it's an opportunity for free medicine, for observation, you know, and, and just to sort of be part of an effort to get another medication for HD on the market. So they have to go through this separate um, study in order to, for the FDA to approve it for this different indication. But really no side effects, really haven't seen much at all. Thank yep. you. All right, any other questions before we let the doctor go? All right, you guys, I got my marching orders. We're gonna figure out how we're gonna do this 555 program here, huh? 555 <laughs> campaign, right? Yeah. 555 <laughs> campaign, bake sales. <laughs> no, I'm only kidding. At any rate, I guess somebody could give $555 to it. Yeah, or I mean, 5,000 <laughs> if they wanted to. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Mindy, I love this idea, Dr. Corey Bloom, of $555. That's a great idea. <laughs> All right, you guys. Thank you very much. Have a great rest of the day. I think I just found it. Oh, good. All right. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Thank you again, Dr. Bloom. Um, so I'm going to be handing it off to our next speaker, Allison. Are you there? Can you hear us? Yes, I'm here. I can hear you. Okay, perfect. Um, you should be able to share your screen if you're doing slides. Okay. No. All right, perfect. And while you're doing that, I'm going to start um, to tell everyone about you. So Allison Bartlett is HGSA's Manager of Disability Program and is a disability attorney who specializes in guiding people with rare chronic conditions like Huntington's disease through the complex Social Security disability system. She comes to HGSA from the Caring Voice Coalition where she represented patients with rare diseases, including HD, in their navigation of the legal processes associated with securing disability support. Allison has more than 10 years of experience in the nonprofit field, working on a variety of issues, including human rights, domestic violence, social justice, and environmental protections. She has traveled extensively and has spent time working in England and studying in Argentina and Switzerland. Allison holds a JD from the University of Cincinnati College of Law and a BA in International Affairs from James Madison University. She um, is admitted to the Virginia Bar. So Allison, thank you so much for joining us today. We are thrilled to have you. And you are going to cover some, some really tough topics, uh, confusing systems to have to navigate. So we're really looking forward to you um, breaking it down for us and, and you know, giving us advice for, for how the family should do that. Thanks, Jamie. So today my presentation is really kind of the tip of the iceberg, like social is never a Topic. It's nothing someone's like, oh my god, Allison gets to talk to us about disability today. Most people are like, oh, we have to listen to Allison. Like, nobody likes, nobody wants to have to come to me. Like, I love helping families and I love doing what I do, but I understand that people don't come to me they want to, they come to me because they can have to. And so there's always complexities that go along. And just so everybody knows, I'm focusing on social security disability today. Um, and there are other, there's a couple different kinds of disability because there's like your private disability insurance that you could get through your employer. Some people pay into a separate disability program. So some people pay into social security, but if let's California, you're gonna pay into the state of California's disability program. And those are two different things. 
And so I like, I just start that, this presentation with people knowing those things. And I can only focus on one beast at a time because this is so complicated. Um, but I'm hoping, my plan is to leave plenty of time for questions at the end, as long as my PowerPoint cooperates. That is not, okay. There we go. My PowerPoint is the mind of its own this morning. I don't know what's going on. Um, so first, I always like to start with the Social Security Act, just kind of going over what it is. Um, so it's an individual, like, and I also like to start with the Social Security Act because it's written in the very confusing federal government language. And that kind of sums up the entire process. Social Security doesn't make this process easy. They don't put it in easy layman's terms. One thing I started to say after doing this for so long is it's kind of like this is a game of monopoly, but they created their whole new set of rules and didn't tell anybody what the rules were. So today is kind of going over like what the rules are and what to expect. So you have a better chance of getting approved for disability and you just better understand this process. Um, but the way social security disability is defined is an individual should be determined to be under a disability only if his or her physical or mental impairments are of such severity that she he or she is not able to do any previous work. Well, so physical or mental impairment has to be medically documented. You can't just say you have HD with no documented proof. You also have to have proof that you cannot do the job that you were doing. And you have to show based on your age, education, and work experience that you can't do any other work in the regional or, na regional or national economy. And that's not just looking at you are in Los Angeles, that's not our San Diego, it's not just looking at where you are in Kenya. Look at jobs across the entire country. So it doesn't matter if the jobs only exist in Georgia and you will tell exist, still gonna say that you could be like it's no one's gonna a job like not in these circumstances. It's not legitimate, but that's how social security defines disability. And so the burdens are, you have to show you have a medical, you have to have HD diagnosed by medical testing. Um, I'll go to this a little bit more, but a gene test is not enough. As Dr. Jody Corey Bloom was saying, when you have HD, you had it from the day you were born. And so they don't really start to track it until you become symptomatic. The same is true for social security. You also have to show that you can no longer work at any job, no matter where it is that your HD symptoms prevent you from working. And I'm gonna talk about a, how you can do those things in this presentation. First, um, first I wanna, there's two different kinds of social security benefits. And this is important because this confuses a lot of people. There's supplemental security income, which is the financial need-based program. So this doesn't look Get your work credits or your work history. It just looks to see if you meet their very strict financial requirement. And so their strict financial requirement is different based on your monthly income because they look at your family size and things like that. But the one thing that's a, the same across the board is you have to have less than $2,000 in resources as an individual and less than $3,000 in resources as a couple. Resources includes cash, stocks, your checking account, your savings account. Um, it includes up to $1,500 set aside for burial expenses. Um, it includes anything you own that could be sold for cash. It includes, if you're married, it includes only one car. So if you have a couple have a car for each of you, one of those cars is going to count against your $3,000 in resources. They don't count the house that you live in, but if you own any additional property, that'll be counted as a resource. Because it, there's such strict financial requirements, the most you could receive is $771 per month. There are no payments to dependents available, and the health insurance that it comes with is Medicaid. And in a lot of states, in about 30 states, if you're found disabled under SSI, you will automatically be enrolled in Medicaid. In about 10 states, you have to submit a separate application, but if you're approved for SSI, your separate Medicaid application will be automatically approved. And then there's a few states, like the fine state that I live in, in Virginia, they have their own requirements. And so what happens to your SSI benefit doesn't matter for their Medicaid requirements. So that's kind of annoying. Um, in California, I'm pretty sure if you get SSI, you get Medi-Cal. And California expanded Medi-Cal, so most people, a lot of people who need it can get it anyway. 
The other benefit is Social Security Disability Insurance, or SSDI. This is the benefit program people want to get benefits through. It's the better, more stable benefit program, and you're entitled to a lot more money. Um, this does have an earnings requirement, and it does require you to have a consistent work history based on your work credits. Everyone who's working, as long as they're earning $5,400 a year, is earning all four of their work credits. In order to be eligible for disability, you have to have 20 work credits, 10 of them, you have to have 40 work credits, 20 of them earned in the last 10 years. And so really it takes five years to earn 20 work credits because five times four is 20. Um, there is no resource limit. You could be getting a million dollar pension and still be eligible for SSDI because the way the system is set up. You can also get payments to dependents. So if you have children, um, a spouse or a parent that's receiving, um, that's receiving more than 50% financial support, all of those people could receive benefits under your SSDI and it doesn't reduce your social security. It's in addition to. Uh, the national average for SSDI is about $1,200 a month, but it can go up to $3,000 a month and be as little as $100 a month, depending on how much you worked. Uh, and the health insurance that comes with SSDI is Medicare, so what you get when you turn 65. And some people, based on their financial criteria, they can be eligible for Medicare and Medicaid at the same time and get SSDI. And it's important to know these different types of benefits because if you do an online application, most of the time the application will ask because you, you can only do SSDI online, but it'll ask if you want to do an S, like if you also want to apply for SSI. For most individuals, I would tell them no because it can, it complicates matters. Most people don't meet the SSI requirement. My only exception is first you have to call Social Security and find out what your SSDI account is before you apply. Because if you don't, you don't get to know what you're going to receive until after you're approved because it disappears from the system. If you're someone who's going to receive less than $771 per month in SSDI, then you should also apply for SSI so you can at least max out the $771 benefit. So this applies more to people who are younger or just, they didn't, maybe they made just enough to earn all four work credits per year, but maybe they only made like $6,000 a year. So they're not going to have a lot of money for their SSDI program. Okay, so a question I get all the time is when is the right time to stop working? Um, so the things you kind of have to ask yourself or you have to ask your loved one with HD is should you keep working? Is it time to apply for disability? And like how does someone know it's the right time? Well, there's always warning signs that can help someone figure that out. It's easier said than done, I know. Um, but some of the important warning signs to look for um, is there's a big difference between being unable to complete job tasks and being wrongly fired because of an HD diagnosis. So most states in the United States are at will employment. That means you can be hired or fired for whatever reason. Let's say because of your HD symptoms, you start having trouble performing the essential tasks of your job. So like as a lawyer, um, if I can know, like if I started messing up in court and I couldn't represent people directly in court anymore, I had a really hard time following up on deadlines and I couldn't make legal arguments, then that means I would have, or like I wasn't performing my essential job tasks anymore. So if I got fired because I couldn't perform my job tasks, that's 100% legal. And so if your employer doesn't know about your HD, you're getting rightfully fired. They have every right to fire you. If you disclose that you have, let's say you have the gene you tested positive, but you're not symptomatic, and you disclose to HR that you have HD and they fire you, even though you can definitely do your job and everything's going okay, then that means you might want to talk to an employment law attorney. But again, if you get fired, you've never disclosed anything to your employer and they don't know, they have no duty to provide accommodations for you and you've been rightly fired. So you have no recourse in that circumstance. So warning signs. Again, as you start to have issues at work. So you have inability to perform job tasks, you have trouble interacting with coworkers and supervisors. That's an important one because Social Security puts a lot of weight on that. If you can't interact with the public, coworkers, and supervisors, that's required in most jobs. So if you have increasing irritability or other anger issues or 
if there's perseveration or like you just get mad at something and you can't let something go, that's a big deal. And that's something social security takes really seriously. And so it's a good reason to be like, maybe I need to step back from my job. Also difficulty actually showing up at work and concentrating during the day. If you're off task just 10% of the time, that's enough that social security deems that you can't work at any job. Um, another warning sign is having trouble holding a job consistently. So you're unable to keep a job for more than three months. You keep getting fired. So you have multiple jobs in a 12 month period. And this is like, so you get hired, but you never get through the training process. Or maybe you get hired and you barely get through the training process and then something happens and you get fired again. That's another red flag. Um, and that's important because Social Security does look to see if you can become an expert at your job. So they have different levels of work, which I'll talk about later. But let's say you want to be a waitress. I, I'm pretty sure Social Security standard is you have to work as a waitress for three months to be considered proficient at that job. But if you get fired after two weeks, then you're not really there long enough to learn the job and become an expert at it. And so that shows to Social Security that you really can't work. Another red flag is if you haven't worked in over 12 months. If you've stopped working and you've been out of work for a year or more and like you haven't been able to find a job you need to apply for disability because your work credits expire or if you're making less than $5,500 a year because it means you're not earning all four work credits. If you don't have enough work credits to apply for disability because you either waited too long or you weren't making enough, no one can fix that. You just can't get disability then, and I don't want anyone to be in that circumstance. So it's really important to be proactive and apply for social security disability as soon as you start to have difficulty working or as soon as you notice a loved one has difficulty working. I know that's easier said than done. I know not everyone with HD is super aware about their symptoms or limitations or their ability to work. And so in those circumstances, I say, well, okay, we've well, had trouble working right now or you had trouble finding a new job. How about we just start this disability process because technically you can work and get disability at the same time. Um, and I'll talk about that in a minute. But I think it's important for everyone when they're starting the disability process, you shouldn't wake up one day and just be like, I'm gonna submit a disability application today. You need to familiarize yourself with the process first and social security's rules and regulations. Um, on the HDSA website, I've made a number of resources to help you get started in the process. There, I have a general tips checklist to help tell you all the information you need for a disability application. You should always call Social Security and confirm that you're still eligible for disability and what you're going to receive in benefits. And then one of the hardest things, people have a really hard time with this, is choosing, so one of the first things will be asked in the application is when did your disability start? This is called your onset date. Oh. So it's the date you allege your disability started. And this date, it's really important to get this date right because if you don't get this date right, if you allege it too soon, you could get denied simply because you picked the wrong date that your disability started. Because Social Security can't just change it. They either have to have enough evidence that they can push it back or they legally have to get your permission. Usually that only happens at a hearing, so you've wasted three years because you chose the wrong onset date. I tell everyone a very simple formula. It's the date you stopped working when it intersects with when you started getting medical care. So let's say you started getting medical care five years ago with Dr. Jody Corey Bloom, and you finally just had to stop working um, on September 1st. You could use September 2nd as your onset date because it's when like your medical care that you've already been getting for a while and the date you stopped working intersect because it always has to be the day after you stop working. But let's say you stopped working two years ago and you didn't start getting medical care until this year. Your onset date couldn't be until this year because again, you need documented medical evidence of your Huntington's disease. A gene test is not enough. You need a clinical diagnosis. Um, and the next thing you wanna familiarize yourself with is Social Security has a listing specifically for Huntington's disease. So it'll tell you exactly what Social Security is looking for. This is listing 11.17. This listing, I have put a simplified version of it on the website and I also include information for exactly what Social Security is looking for. We'll go into a little more de detail later. And then you also need, so within that, you need to make sure you're seeing your doctors on a regular basis. Yeah, yeah. Global pandemic has definitely messed things up. 
totally recognize that. So they're like, I know some people haven't been able to physically get in for an appointment. We are moving more towards telemedicine and social security does accept that because they've also had to go to like, they're also working from home. Um, but so if you, aside from what the weird things going on in the world, you do wanna make sure you see your doctors as often as possible. And it's always good to see as many doctors as like are recommended to you because you don't just want to submit records from your neurologist. If you see a physical therapist, you want to include those. If you see um, a licensed clinical social worker as your therapist, you want to include that information. You want to include stuff from your primary care physician because you don't know what really awesome evidence they could have unless you requested everything over the course of your medical care and know exactly what's in your records. You also want to make sure you request compassion and allowance for Huntington's disease because do not ever make the assumption that Social Security knows how to treat a Huntington's disease case. Huntington's disease is incredibly rare and Social Security spends most of their time analyzing cases that have to do with things like chronic pain, spinal issues, back pain issues, depression, all these other issues. They don't know a lot about Huntington's disease, so you have to educate them. And one of the easiest things you can do is make sure you request compassion and allowance. Say, I should be found disabled per listing 11.17 for Huntington's disease, and my case should be cut, flagged for compassion and allowance. Just you want to give them a roadmap. Um, you also need to understand your own symptoms and limitations or your loved one's symptoms and limitations so you can adequately and accurately describe them in the application and give Social Security as much detail as possible. You also want to gather evidence before you start the disability process. So when I was representing families directly, it could take me three months to gather all the medical evidence I needed before I even started a disability. And I'm not saying it has to take you that long. I'm just trying to give examples. Like it could take a while to work with medical record departments or just, it takes time to gather this stuff. And the more evidence you gather up front, the stronger your claim will be. And just, this um, is from one of my resources. It's on HDSS website. It's about compassionate allowance. And it goes over, it tells Social Security says what kind of medical evidence they're looking for when they evaluate an HD claim. So they're looking for documented progression of motor, cognitive, and psychiatric symptoms, you know, the triad that Dr. Jody Corrid Bloom is talking about, a family history of HD, and an abnormal neurological findings consistent with HD. So that includes like a neuropsych test or even a MOCA exam, just a lot of little things that they do in the clinic. Um, they also, you don't have to have a gene test. A gene test is not necessary for a disability application, but they'll take it if you have it. Brain imaging, in my professional experience, I haven't seen a lot of helpful brain imaging because usually the doctors who do brain imaging don't really know enough about HD. Because in my professional experience, whenever I've looked at medical records from the centers of excellence, they don't send people to get an MRI willy-nilly. It's usually neurologists or primary care physicians who don't know enough about HD because unless you've had multiple over the years, you can't really show somebody has HD in their brain unless you have a lot of diagnostic testing done and that doesn't happen. And then psychological or psychiatric reports, again, like neurocognitive testing. The one thing it says that everyone has to look out for is diagnosis of HD or laboratory testing results alone do not make listing severity. So again, if you're someone who just got a positive HD gene result, do not quit your job, do not apply for disability. You will get denied. So don't do it. You don't need that hassle in your life. Um, and just, there is no standard timeline for applying for disability. You have to determine what works best for you. And again, you can continue working while your application is pending if you meet certain criteria. And so I know there are a lot of people who do want to keep working, and in certain circumstances, you can. This is not an all or nothing proposition. You don't have to show that you've become a couch potato that can't do anything. That's not what the definition of disability is. The definition is that your HD impacts you enough that you can no longer work. Working is not the only thing that defines who you are or defines your life. And so it's, we'll talk about that a little more. And I think that, you know, that tricks people up sometimes. They think they have to show that they're so completely disabled and that's not the case. You can still do a lot of other things in your life, but just not work. One thing that work does to a lot of people, even though they won't admit it, is work is really stressful. Stress exacerbates all conditions and it especially exacerbates Huntington's disease. 
And so there are a lot of people that I've worked with over the years that end, like after they stopped working and ended up getting on disability, it helped relieve a lot of stress in their life and it maybe even like lessened their symptoms. And so they got a better quality of life. And that's really what's important. If you're so stressed out that you're worried you're gonna get fired because of your symptoms and limitations, or that you're not performing at the same level you were, that stress is really, it's impacting you in ways you may not think about. And so maybe that's another reason, like to say when it's time to apply for disability. Because I don't want anybody to be so stressed out to the point that they're not living the best life. So I'm gonna go over Social Security's five-step sequential evaluation. And the reason it's sequential, because you have to do things in order. If you don't meet step one, you can't go any further in the process. So you have to meet step one to get to step two, you have to meet step two to get to step three. If you meet step three, you should be found disabled at step three. I find that doesn't happen as often as it should in HD. So then if you, they say you don't meet step three, you go to step four. If they show that you do meet step four, then you go to step five. And if like they show you're not able to work, then you're approved for disability. But like if you don't meet at any step in that process, you don't meet it except for step three, usually that means it's a denial. So the only stage where you can say no and still move on is step three. All the other steps, if you say no, you get denied. So step one, is the person engaged in substantial gainful activity? So social security doesn't define work as actually physically having a job and going to work every day. They define it as a monetary amount. And it lines up with federal minimum wage. So really what they're saying is you can't work enough to physically support yourself. And so in 2020, the substantial gainful activity amount is $1,260 per month gross. So before taxes, that's not what you see on your final paycheck. It's like you put a box on your giant paycheck, like this is the giant number you see and it's like a little number way over here. You have to make sure you're careful about that. Um, but the point is you can definitely keep working while you're applying for disability, but you have to be really careful because if you go over that amount, you could be denied like that. Um, it can be really hard for someone with HD to keep track of something that's complicated. So if you have a loved one who's going to keep working, you better make sure you're going to help them manage this because you don't want to go through this whole process just for them to get denied because they were making too much money. Um, and another thing to keep in mind, the Social Security does look at something called an unsuccessful work attempt. Let's say you stop working, you start the disability process, and then you want to try working again because the job opportunities come up. If you work for less than six months and have to quit again because of your symptoms, Social Security won't count those six months against you. And this is really relevant if somebody ends up getting to the hearing stage of the process and they've been waiting for a few years. Sometimes you just have to try new things. Um, and then step two of the process is does the person have a medically determinable impairment or combination of impairments that is considered severe? So medically determinable impairment is just a diagnosed condition. So if you've been clinically diagnosed or with Huntington's disease, you have a medically determinable impairment. So severe. Um, is So Social Security considers something severe if your impairment or combination of impairments um, limits your physical or mental ability to do basic work activities and your condition has lasted or will last 12 months or longer. And this is important to note. A lot of people think you have to be out of work for a year before you can apply for disability. You don't. We all know that Huntington's disease currently is not curable, so it's definitely going to last 12 months or longer. And so that's all you have to show. And so that's again why it's important to be like, hey, Social Security, in addition to all of my relevant HD information, here's what HD is and just tell them as much information as possible. And then, so once we get to step three, is does a person's impairment or combination of impairments meet or medically equal the criteria of an impairment listing? Um, so there's actually a lot of different listings and they describe for each major body system. So your circulatory system, your digestive system, they have neurological conditions, they have mental conditions, they have whatever your kidneys a part of. I, I know I should know better, but I, because like, no, <laughs> um, 
because they pretty much got rid of everything kidney related except like kidney disease. Some of like neurological conditions, there's a lot of them. Chronic pain and like spinal conditions, there's a lot of them. Um, mental conditions, there's a lot of them. But like listing 6.0, it's literally like, oh, you have kidney disease. That's it. And like listing five point, like things under five, like you have liver disease or your stomach hates you. So some of the listings have a lot of options and some of them they remove most of them. Um, with Huntington's disease, it's really hard to equal the listing. You probably, like, you pretty much just have to meet it. Other conditions, they're more open because not every condition has a listing. Narcolepsy, for instance, doesn't have a social security listing. And so to be found disabled for narcolepsy, they say it's most like epilepsy. So, or, that's not the case for Huntington's disease. Huntington's disease has a very specific listing. So pretty much you have to meet it. It's hard to show that it equals. I don't know. Okay, listing 11.17 for Huntington's disease. So to be found disabled, you have to show that you either have disorganization of motor function in two extremities, resulting in an extremity is your hands, your arms, your legs, your feet. Um, so you have to have disorganization of motor function in two extremities resulting in an extreme limitation in the ability to stand from a seated position, balance while standing or walking, or use your upper extremities. And so if someone has pretty severe chorea or they're an extreme fall risk, they're somebody who can meet that standard for A. Most people with Huntington's disease who are going to be found disabled are going to meet the criteria for B. So that means you have to have marked limitation in physical functioning and one of the following or just the following. Understanding, remembering, or applying information, interacting with others, concentrating, persisting, or maintaining pace, or adapting or managing yourself. Well, what does that mean? I'm not gonna go into detail about it today, but the list are hard. The resource I've created that's on HDSA's website gives clear examples of what Social Security is looking for in each of those topic areas. Because it's not like, Social Security just makes up words. They did work with doctors to come up with these standards, but the general population, we don't know what that means. Then they have defined it. They just don't make it easy to find those examples, which is why I created a resource. So it makes it a lot easier for you guys to find those examples. There we go, okay. And so really, in my professional opinion, I think most people with HD should be found disabled at step three, but the doctors who review a lot of these HD cases, I don't think know enough about Huntington's disease. And so instead of finding someone disabled like they should, most people with HD have to prove step four and step five. Step four is, does a person have the residual functional capacity to perform the requirements of his or her past work? So your past relevant work is things you have done in the last 15 years. You must have done that work for substantial gainful activity. So if you worked somewhere for the last 15 years, I don't know, let's say of the last 15 years, two of those years, you only worked part-time and you were making $1,000 a month. That doesn't count as relevant work for Social Security purposes because you weren't performing it at substantial gainful activity. But the 13 years of work before that will count. Um, you also have to perform the work long enough to learn the job. So again, if like you're getting all these waitressing jobs, but you're only there for like two to three weeks and you can't stay anywhere longer, then are you really learning the job for Social Security purposes? No. Social Security has three different levels of skill levels of job. So you could have an unskilled job, a semi-skilled job, or a skilled job. So me as a lawyer, that's considered a skilled job. When they're going through this analysis, they start off with skilled work or whatever work you are and work their way down. So since I'm a lawyer, they'd be like, okay, well, she clearly was doing skilled work. Can she still do skilled work? Yes or no? No. Can she do semi-skilled work? Yes or no? No. Can she do unskilled work? Maybe. And then, and so that's kind of how they do that process. And then they go into that process further by when they go to step five, and they look to see if that person is able to do any other work considering their residual functional capacity, age, education, and work experience. So your residual functional capacity is the most you can still do. So it's broken down into like how long can you sit, stand, or walk? 
how much can you lift and carry, how long can you use your hands and your arms. Um, so like your actual physical abilities. Um, and then non-exertional things like balance, stoop, kneel, crouch, crawl, or, crawl, or climb. Um, they take into consideration exposures to, temp to extreme temperatures, fumes, chemicals, or dust. So let's say you have HD and you also have asthma in addition to your HD. It's really important to mention that because your asthma will limit your ability to be exposed to extreme temperatures, fumes, chemicals, or dust, which would further reduce your ability to do other work. It's also, I kind of skipped past that, I'm sorry. Um, when you apply for disability, even though HD is likely what's gonna be the most disabling thing for you, if you have any other diagnoses or conditions, you need to include those in your application. As Dr. Jody Corey Bloom was saying, a lot of patients, their psychiatric symptoms include like depression or OCD or suicidal ideation. Depression has its own listing. Anxiety has its own listing. OCD has its own listing. It's called something else, can't remember off the top of my head, but it has its own listing. And so all of those make your application stronger. So they each have their own set of requirements. And as even if you have depression as a result of your HD, you can meet the HD requirements and the depression requirements, which just helps strengthen your case. Um, and then mental residual functional capacity, that includes things like taking unscheduled breaks during the day. Social Security hates it when people take unscheduled breaks, and so do employers. If it's something employers won't tolerate, then you won't work because no one in the country will hire you. Amount of time off task, again, 10% or more of the time. Days absent from work. If you're absent from work, that includes coming in late or leaving early more than two days per month. In most cases, that means you're going to get fired. And so it means most likely you're not going to get hired anywhere because an employer won't tolerate that or your ability to interact with supervisors, coworkers, and the public. Okay, and so how you can kind of meet these steps. First, gathering evidence. So gather all the necessary documents, including medical records, education records, medication list, and work history. If you're older, let's say you're 45, when you wanna apply for disability, you're not gonna need education records. But let's say you're 22. Your education records could come in really handy because it could show maybe when you started college at 18, you were doing okay with everything, but by the time you finished school, you were really struggling and that can show the decline. You also want to create a list of persons with firsthand knowledge of your symptoms and the impact your condition has on your quality of life. Because when you live with something like Huntington's disease every day, you likely don't recognize all the things that have changed. But someone who's on the outside and has seen things change, they can help you talk about it and include things in your application. I know I would ask clients simple questions all the time that would really be like, oh, I didn't think about that, but yeah, that's something that's changed. Like even something like one question that I always like to ask is, can you watch a two hour movie and not just watch it, but can you pay attention? Do you follow along to the plot? Do you get confused? Do you have to like rewatch things to understand them? Or can you watch the movie the same way you did five years ago? And usually the answer is no, but it's really important to be able to talk about why. The why things have changed and the why you can't do things is gonna help you get approved for disability. And then last, after gathering and creating, you can file your application, usually in person over the phone or online right now, in-person operations are all still closed. No social security office is open. Don't go to one, you're gonna just be locked out and feel silly. Um, so you can only apply over the phone or online. Because of the nature of HD, because I have concerns that social security doesn't understand it well, I prefer people apply online because then you get to tell your side of the story. If you apply over the phone, Social Security is just writing what you say, but you have no way to confirm they get things done correctly. You do it in the online application. You can take a few days or a few weeks to complete it, so you can take as much time as you need. You can make sure you include everything you need to include. And it's, again, it's important to include all your diagnoses and limitations and include all your treating physicians, not just your neurology staff. Um, and you can just, you can make sure it's the most accurate reflection of yourself because on the online application, you get remarks sections where you just get to tell Social Security whatever you want. I don't think you get to do that on, over the phone, so stuff can get missed. And it's important to note that when the life of an application, the application process does not end just because you've submitted the application. You need to continue to get medical care. 
you need to talk to Social Security every time you get medical care. So in the application, it'll ask you those upcoming appointments. Let's say you didn't like something gets scheduled that wasn't originally scheduled when you submit your application. You need to call Social Security and tell them when that appointment happens. You need to complete any and all forms Social Security sends you because they're going to send you forms. That's, they always send something called an adult function report. They often send a work history report. So you have to pay attention to deadlines and complete the forms in a timely manner. You need to provide as much detail as possible. The forms often don't provide enough room for answers, add extra sheets of paper. The questions can be confusing. Call Allison, she'll tell you how to answer the questions. And if you don't wanna to talk to me, call Social Security and ask them your questions because that's why they're there. Sometimes you might try to call Social Security first and they don't call you back, and so then call me. I've had to deal with that so many times. Um, you might get asked to attend a consultative exam. Of all the disease groups that I've represented, Huntington's disease patients get asked to attend consultative exams more than any other group. And most of the time, these are straightforward. Like, it's because Huntington's disease patients usually only see a doctor every six months to a year, but Social Security wants you to see a doctor every three months, so sometimes they just want you to see their doctor to fit into their timeline. Sometimes they just need to confirm your mental status testing, so they'll send you to their own mental status doctor. Um, and that's not a bad thing. Like, if you're asked to go to a consultative exam, you have to go. If you don't go, you're likely going to get denied, and you don't want to get denied for that. The decision timeline for the initial application, the general decision timeline is six months. For reconsideration, it's three to four. And for an administrative law judge hearing, it can take 18 to 24 months for a hearing to be scheduled. That can go a lot faster for Huntington's disease families, especially if the claims five for compassion and allowance. But then it still can take two to four months to get a decision. Another option is you could have an on the record review, which is where you ask the judge review all the written evidence in the case and you don't have to have a hearing if you're approved on the record. So these are all pre-COVID timelines. Um, well, federally, at the national level, Social Security didn't close. The federal level is only responsible for one portion of your disability claim. State agencies review the medical records. They're the ones who are in charge of collecting medical evidence. A lot of those closed. Social Security did not publicly announce that or disclose that, but a lot of them are backed out. And so this, like, I can't really be on it. I can't guarantee, like, the length of time right now. Hearings, I think, are happening faster because they're happening over the phone since they can't happen in person. But other stages of the process, those might be a little bit delayed and things might be a little confusing because I think Social Security has been really backed out recently. And then best practices. Do not undermine your symptoms and limitations. Do not make it seem you are better than you are. That's a guaranteed way for yourself to get denied. So one, you, your medical records and what you say in your application have to match. So if you're not being honest with your doctor, you're not telling them the truth, and then you tell the truth in the disability application, they're not gonna believe you because your medical records don't support that. They're gonna be like, oh, they're just telling a tall tale, or why are they being overly descriptive now? But if you like your medical records say one thing, but in your whole application, you're like, I can work, I'm fine, I wanna work, I don't need this, then why would Social Security give it to you? If you don't think you need it or deserve it, why should they give it to you? Um, ask for help if you need help. This is not something that should be completed alone. I don't think any HD individual should, especially if they're positive and they're doing it for themselves, should complete an application alone. So, I went to school four years. When I first started doing disability applications, my supervisor had to review all my applications for six months. For like at least three or four of those six months, she would send every application back to me with errors that needed to be corrected. And I'm telling you this because it means like somebody else should look over the application before you send it in. It's always good to have another set of eyes and to take time and be careful because mistakes happen. Or human when you're on an online application and not something you've seen before it can be tricky so just slow down be careful get help like it's always better to get help um, ask questions if you have questions this is not an easy or intuitive process work with your doctors and social workers throughout this process and keep them informed 
you should tell them if you want to apply for disability because I know in a lot of circumstances they'll change the way they track your medical record notes or they'll start saying things like so and so's indicated that they've started to have trouble at work. This could be related to like the test results we saw today or like they might say like we've noticed they've started having more of these issues impact their ability to work. Like it allows your doctor to put more information in if they are, if like you make them an active part of this process. Track all of your doctor's appointments and contact information so you put the correct information in your application. Keep an up-to-date list of your medications and why you take them and if you have any side effects. Follow up with Social Security regularly once you have submitted your application. Confirm your application has been received. Confirm when the application is sent from the field office to Disability Determination Services so you know where everything is in the process. Call Social Security and confirm they have your medical records, especially your HD medical records. You have every right to do that. They're not going to call you about this stuff. You have to be your own active advocate. Again, just like information about Social Security and COVID, and I've touched on this. Um, Social Security is continuing to operate at this time. They've kind of worked out the kinks and they're getting better. There are still no in-person operations, so you have to use phone or online resources. Um, I think they're getting back into like taking all disability cases, but especially when COVID, when the pan like, when everything first shut down, they were only really focusing on compassionate allowance cases, which makes it so important to make sure your case is correctly flagged for compassionate allowance, because it means it should get looked at more often and should take priority. And it won't do that if your case isn't flagged for compassionate allowance. So you have to call your local field office and you have to be like, did you do this? No, I need to talk to a supervisor because you're dumb. Maybe don't call them dumb, just in your mind call them dumb to make yourself feel better. In my experience, unless somebody's worked at Social Security for like 15 years, you're not, you're not sure what you're going to get. I was told working at Social Security, like in order to be trained, to be an effective Social Security employee is like going to law school. And I was like, oh, there are a lot of lawyers who couldn't make it through law school. I can't imagine all the people at Social Security who struggle with this. Anyway, um, Again, the initial application process could take longer than six months. You may not get any updates or responses from Social Security, but that doesn't mean they're not working on your case. I truly believe they are really backed up right now. Um, and if you need to contact your local hearing office, oh yeah, um, you definitely need to contact your hearing office if you're waiting for a hearing. Some of us, oh, blah, blah. Some offices are performing hearings by phone and some are starting to do video hearings with Microsoft Teams. You do technically have the choice to wait for an in-person hearing, but I don't know how long you could be waiting, so I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't take that risk. I would just go ahead and have your hearing now because you just, you don't know. Okay. Any questions? I have so many questions. <laughs> um, so first of all, once the case is adjudicated, right, and a decision has been made, and let's say the Social Security has been granted, are there okay. then um, check-ins after that by Social Security? Yes, there are. So anyone who's approved for Social Security disability for every diagnosis, there you eventually will get something called a continuing disability review. So Social Security reviews every claim. Technically, with Huntington's disease, your case should only be reviewed every five to seven years. Ask me if Social Security correctly buys HD cases. I bet they don't. <laughs> yeah, they, they don't. Um, so I saw, I like work with people who had to get their case reviewed every year. Sometimes it's more likely Social Security will have it reviewed every three years. Um, but what happens is, because there's different levels. So there's conditions that will likely improve there's conditions that might improve and there's conditions that aren't going to improve. So social or so HD should fall into the not going to improve category. Sometimes it falls into the might improve category. And so that changes what you could get with the continuing disability review. If it's correctly flagged, you're literally gonna get um, a piece of paper that's double-sided that maybe asks like 10 questions like, are you still disabled? Are you still seeing your doctor? When did you last go to your doctor? Did your doctor say you're still disabled? The really the hard thing though with HD is let's say somebody can progress a lot in five years Absolutely. and so and like let's say you like let's say I'm the person with HD and I like 
I use my, like they only have the address I used on the initial application originally and they send everything there. What if I can't answer those things anymore? Like defi that definitely like kind of creates an issue. Um, I haven't seen that as much from families like, because uh, I did continuing disability review stuff too in my practice and I didn't get as many questions from HD families. And so I don't know if that was a struggle they had because it was just not something I saw very often. What I saw more often is when my clients that had pulmonary hypertension, which all social security also hates, um, trying to show that they were still disabled. The thing is, though, is it, one would think that if you have a diagnosis of Huntington's disease or any similar disease where there's no cure, there's no way you're going to get better, and also your cognitive abilities decline over time, that it's not reasonable to ask people to continue to check in. It's not reasonable, but the is social security reasonable? No. When I think another thing too, <laughs> I'm a lot of social security hate. I'm just going to be upfront. Like <laughs> the reason I had to stop representing clients is because social security itself caused me so much stress. Um, but one thing I know, especially with Huntington's disease, is a lot of times HD people who are found disabled, they're appointed a representative payee because of their ability to manage their finances and their disability benefits. And so someone, if they have a representative payee, Social Security is going to do a lot more stuff through the representative payee, which is beneficial. Um, that can be a hard debate because sometimes you think someone should have a representative payee, but Social Security is like, well, they answered enough of our easy questions. So no, they don't need a representative payee. Sometimes it's something you have to go back and evaluate because you can have that person, you can be like, hey, I think this person needs a representative payee. Can we do another evaluation? Like, how do we deal with this? But like, unfortunately, I don't have a lot of good recommendations at this point about the continuing disability review because I haven't heard enough things from families about how they've had to deal with it. Um, I did work with Doug. Um, I was just gonna make a comment. I just got my wife on social security. And when I started the process, and this is for those in San Diego County, when I started the process, I called the national number and it was a nightmare. And then I ended up calling the local office in San Marcos and it was a little bit of a wait, but they were very helpful and very fair in my difficult process to get my wife to sign, you know, get, getting approval to sign her up. So um, those who are, and they don't do teleconferencing, but they are very fair with uh, allowing someone else to witness signatures. So um, those in San Diego County, the San Marcos office, uh, I thought was really good. Thank you for bringing that up. Um, I hate the national number. Don't call it. Please, please save yourself, all of you, save yourselves from the horrendous thing that is the national number. Um, <laughs> Amy, stop laughing at me. Um, so I, okay, so the only time I tell people to call the national number because <sighs> social security. So there's a website where you can put your zip code in and it'll tell you your office information. Not every field office has their phone number online. Every field office gets to make that decision for themselves. So then I would tell you to call the national number just to get your field office number. So the national office, they, like if you're calling to follow up on your disability claim, they can't give you any information. The only people who can tell you anything about your disability claim is your local field office. And you would not know that unless you had to waste so much of your life calling social security, like hate the state of Maryland because they, so sometimes what happens is a field office number is so busy, they send you to a different field office in the area. The other field office can't even tell you anything about your claim. And I'm like, then why, why'd you do that? Why am I here today? Can you get me transferred to the right people? Sorry, ma'am, no. Can I kill you? No, no, don't do that. Um, but I, like, if you guys have struggles, trust me, I understand. Like I've been through some of these things and so, do I have great advice for having to deal with those things sometimes? No, sometimes you just say, you say a frustrated thank you, you scream when you get off the phone, and you call again the next day. In my case, they assigned one person to deal with our situation, and that person was very good, and I could call the number and go to her extension if she, 
she was either, if she wasn't available, she would call you back. So it was good. I'm glad you got someone who is really responsive and prompt and actually returned your phone calls. And yeah, everybody is technically assigned. Um, what is it? A clean. They have two different names. They're called one thing at the field office and something else at DDS, and I was confused. But everybody's actually assigned two different people, someone at your field office. So if you can get their name and extension, that can be really, really helpful. Sometimes you can't get that information because they won't give it out. Some people hate sharing their information. So if you're lucky, like Doug, and you get an awesome person to work with, hold on to that information and call them for whatever you may need. Um, and I'm sure Doug to you like when you called with like an actual question and you're like hey I need help with this or I have something like I don't understand they're usually pretty responsive if you call and you're just like I want an update they don't handle that well they're not going to give you a call back if you just call asking for an update but in my experience if you call with a real substantial question even if it's just like hey I have I see this doctor, I want to make sure you got these medical records, or hey, I know you sent us this form, I returned it, I wanted to make sure you get it. Hey, I got this form. Um, it was mailed two weeks ago, but I got it yesterday. Can I get an extension? Hey, I got this form. I don't understand this question, or there's not enough room for an answer. Can I add additional information? Like, Social Security generally responds better to those things. And like, I am serious. If you're talking with someone who's maybe only worked at Social Security for three or four years who may not know anything about HD or compassionate allowance or how those two things go together, it's definitely okay to ask for a supervisor because usually those are people who've been there for a long time. Or sometimes you have to ask for the claim to get expedited or you have to ask for the claim to get escalated. There's a lot, there are a lot of different things that can happen. And in this circumstance, because of the complexity of HD within the disability system, it's okay to ask to talk to somebody who knows what they're talking about. Can I just make a comment? Yes, please. About uh, the follow-up. My son has been on social security disability for seven years and they've never followed up. They've never asked him any questions. So, so they're, they're, <laughs> they are definitely behind. Like, I know, I don't know how far they're behind. Like, they could easily be a year to 18 months behind. Eventually, you should get something. If you don't, you know, you're lucky. Like, oh, yeah. good for you. But <laughs> I'm assuming eventually at some point you'll get something. But that means you should get the really simple form that's literally like one piece of paper front and back that has like 10 straightforward questions on it. Yeah. Maybe you guys are just really lucky where you are and you have a really together office. That's. Yeah. Uh, it's, I was very surprised. And in my case, my wife's in a rest home and um, I told her that uh, they, she isn't able to sign documents. And we had to do a phone interview. I had the caregiver at the rest home. I, uh, we called Social Security, put her on speakerphone, and she was asking my wife simple questions like, what is your date of birth? And she couldn't verbalize the entire thing. And after a few minutes, she got the gist that I wasn't trying to scam her. And she was very cooperative and very fair about following through to get my wife Social Security. So I was very happy and very surprised. Yeah. And that can be helpful. It's just, it's hard because like some of these caseworkers, like you can tell they really do have a heart and they're like, I'm going to do whatever I can to help these people who are truly disabled try to get benefits. And some people are just seem like so jaded by the system. Mm -hmm. And that's something like you can submit a perfect disability application and still get denied because none of us can account for the human component of this. And so you could like your case could be reviewed by a doctor who spent 10 minutes and didn't know anything about Huntington's disease. It could be sent to a, a caseworker who is having a crappy year and should not be employed with Social Security. But, you know, beggars can't be choosers. Um, and so that's something that's really hard. And that's why I do always tell HD families, like if you get denied the first time or even the second time, it's still worth fighting. Like get to the point where you appear before a judge because a judge is your best bet of getting an approval if you don't get approved at the initial application stage because in my experience the judges are the most competent they actually take the time to sit there and review the case and there can be special extenuating circumstances like i had a client um 
her date last insured was in 2011. And there was a lot of stuff that happened in her life. And so we were trying to show that she was disabled in 2018, all the way back in 2011. Um, before we could have her hearing, she took her own life. And so I had to work with her husband. Mm. And we got a very, very understanding judge. Like, there was enough there and the husband did such a wonderful job and the judge was compassionate enough that she was like, this person has passed. There's enough that I'm okay with giving them this like one time lump sum benefit. And that doesn't always happen, but like you can't like, I tell people it's still at least worth trying. Sometimes it's a very difficult and possible case. Like no other attorney was ever going to touch that case because it was an impossible case, but I didn't do it because I was in it. I never did anything because I'm in it for the money. I do it because I want families to get the benefits that they deserve. And so that can be hard and it can be hard to find an attorney who's willing to fight with you about that. I've, I found, I think I have some good resources now. Like, I, I think there might be some good people out there. There's a guy in Colorado. I know it's not in California, but it's okay. You don't have to live in a state. Like the attorney can be anywhere in the United States to represent you. His background is in MS, but he does a lot of work with HD. And he's also someone who's willing to represent people who are, have more difficult cases, which can be hard to find. And I'm here just for people to talk to and to be a resource because I know disability can be a very lonely and isolating process. It's complicated. Nobody understands the process. Nobody understands HD. And so it's nice just to have someone to talk to. Um, so thank you guys for inviting me to talk today. Like, I know this is not the most fun topic. It's thank like... You. Thank you for being an advocate. Yeah, thank you. That by far was the best breakdown I've ever seen to date of, of benefits. Well, and I do it in such, you know, a fun way. Like <laughs> <laughs> you share in the, the angst and the frustration, which I appreciate. <laughs> it's a very frustrating you know, process, I'll tell you. <laughs> it is, and so like it really does help to know like I've, I have different, like, my frustrations are there for different reasons, but, like, when people tell me it's frustrating, like, trust me, I get you. Like, they almost made me fly to Alabama for no reason. I got out of it, only to, like, drive two hours away for a hearing, and the judge was like, oh, yeah, no, we're wrong. They're disabled. And I was like, why am I here? Why do you always do this? So, you know. That's always a good thing. Like that, that actually does happen a lot. You get to the hearing stage and the judge has actually read through everything and they're like, oh, Huntington's disease. Why, why are we here? Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, family. Here's your benefits. Good luck. Have a nice day. And, and Allison, uh, we're going to, um, on our website, put a link to all your webinars and this um, Education Day recording too. So, Good. Um, people have access to your wonderful information. Well, yeah. thank you. And um, I know like one thing I've started doing because HD never, in an ideal world, HD wouldn't exist. And we all know that. And like, and so one thing I'm trying to do is start people like with the disability and insurance and everything process as early in the process as possible. And, ag and again, that's like in an ideal circumstance some people find out they have hd in a crazy way like they like the gene mutated or like the person who had it in their family left their family a long time ago and they like things happen so we know there's always extenuating circumstances but i'm trying to start having the conversation sooner so people not only get their social security disability benefits but they can get like other insurance benefits and other things that they need because I think we all know like the earlier in the process you can start having these conversations and you can start talking about finances and power of attorney and things like the better the protections you get. Yeah. I, I totally agree with the fact that families don't start early enough to start planning for five, 10 years down the road with honey. Wow. There's a lot of resources out there and it's so much easier to kind of get your head around the whole package when you start early, then rather wait for the crisis to start unraveling and then try to play catch up. So thanks for saying that. Yes. Yeah, because yeah, nobody wants to be like, because everyone assumes if you're trying to talk about a will or life planning, you're like, why are you assuming I'm going to die? life is a cause of death, first of all, but it's not about dying. It's about like, what do you want? 
what do you care about and what do you want to make sure is protected down the line? And so I think if we shift the focus for like why we're doing that, I think that can help with the conversation too. Does anybody else have any questions for me? Nope, oh, just want to say thank you. Again. Yeah, thank you, Allison. What is the best thank way for you. people to get in touch with you if they have any questions? Let me, eh. I'll share my screen again really quickly. Um, so here is my contact information. So you can reach me by phone or email. I will say it's usually best to reach out to me by email first because especially like what I like to do is I like to schedule a phone call with families because I don't want to call you when you're like out running errands or you don't know where your stuff is because a disability conversation is not something you want to have at the drop of the hat. So I like everyone to be prepared. And emailing first can give me the background information I need to look for resources so I have that information when we talk. That sounds good. Well, thank you again so much. We appreciate you and your time. Um, and <laughs> I look forward to, you know, keeping in touch and, um, you know, we, we really appreciate you. You know, hopefully when all this is said and done, I can actually make my trip out to California at some point. We would love to have you. <laughs> yeah. All right, everyone, thank you so much for joining today. Um, we'll be sending out an email with the speakers for the next educational series. So be on the lookout for that. Um, otherwise, enjoy the rest of your Saturday. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.